It's located here in Madison. Uh, we have a, a location here in Madison where two of our research units are located and our main building is on campus. And we also have a research unit that's up in Marshfield in central Wisconsin. And uh, we have uh, research farms associated with both of those locations with the Prairie de Sac research unit, uh, just about 45 minutes northwest of Madison. And then we have a partnership with UW, not only at that farm, but also at uh, the UW farm near Marshfield, where they do most of their heifer rearing and some of the first lactation cows are up there. Um, just a quick announcement, so most of you heard this earlier, but if you are a CCA certified crop advisor, we do have continuing edu education units available for you. So uh, the sign-up sheet is over there. You can also scan it on your app uh, so that you can uh, get credit for being here today. A couple other introductions before getting to our speaker that I want to make as a couple new faculty at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, and I'll first turn to um, Marta Corman, who is our uh, forage systems agro agroecologist. I almost got it right. Uh, in about a year or so from now, I'll finally get it right, Marta. Um, and then also Scott Newell, who is an alfalfa outreach specialist for the nation. He is uh, based with uh, UW Extension, uh, but does uh, regional and national extension efforts related specifically to alfalfa. So with that, let's go ahead and introduce our uh, first speaker today. And uh, really a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Joe Lauer here uh, from UW-Madison. He's got a wealth of experience with uh, corn silage and, and uh, a lot of different varieties, the agronomics associated with uh, growing corn silage, as well as uh, uh, other management aspects of, of the production of that crop. And as uh, many of us refer to alfalfa as the queen of, of forages, well, corn, corn is still king uh, when it comes to our forage crops as well. So with no further ado, Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate it. <clears throat> yeah, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, corn silage and, and kind of our experience with it here. And I'm going to kind of run through all things, these slides a little quickly, but you have a printout of a lot of this. So hopefully uh, you can go back and refer to some of these things. I just want to kind of hit the highlights on on uh, a few of these things. And I'm going to start with this slide here. And this slide is basically the corn silage yield for uh, the U.S. first. And we've been increasing, like, like corn for grain, we've been increasing, well, corn for grain, we've been increasing about two bushels per, per acre per year. On corn silage, we're seeing the same thing, about uh, 0.23 tons per acre uh, per year. And Wisconsin is very similar. Uh, basically following the national trends. And then you got us, and uh, we're down on the right, lower right there, and we're increasing at about a tenth of a ton of dry matter per acre. And this is one of the things about the USDA statistics that bugs the heck out of me, because what we've got here is, if you multiply out, uh, at the end there, we're at about 10 tons of dry matter per acre, if you multiply that by three, which gets you to a field basis, that's 30 tons fresh, basically, per acre. And yet, this number here, we're at about 22 tons of, of silage per acre. And if you divide that by three, that's seven. And it's a number that, to me, really doesn't mean a lot because it's kind of in between dry matter yields and field yields. And it'd be nice to be able to get at an accurate number for corn silage yield because I think people report both fresh field yields as well as dry matter yields. And I think we get a number that ends up in between. And uh, it'd be nice if we could get it to a dry matter per acre basis. But um, anyway, question? No, this is just yields across the state and across the US. 
but it's kind of a pet peeve of mine, and I just wanted to bring that up. I, um, I don't know if we'll be able to ever correct that, but uh, it's a number that's in between and doesn't really represent anything out there. Now, as you think about corn silage on a farm basis, there's a lot of decisions that go into this. But typically in the end, what ends up in the bunker is usually the last planted field, the worst looking field. Usually, uh, usually it's not very well fertilized and, and that sort of a thing because, and frankly, I don't, uh, you know, it's probably the only, th only use that that field might be good for. But it's typically a field that isn't very well managed and oftentimes, but yet there can be some really significant swings based upon whether the hybrid you choose, uh, the planting date, for example, you can have a 2.2 ton per acre swing just on planting date, May 1 versus June 1, and harvest timing and that sort of a thing. Huge sw yield swings that can oftentimes occur with, uh, with some of the decisions that need to be made. So I just put a few of these up here, and I'm just highlighting the yield, but this translates also into milk per ton as well as milk per acre. So what I want to do today, then, is basically concentrate on just a couple of these things, uh, choosing the right hybrid and how we approach that here in Wisconsin, uh, a, few, a few things about managing the crop for optimum growth and development, and then harvesting at the right content, because at some point, during the life cycle of corn silage, at least, yield doesn't matter, okay? And really what you're doing at the very end is harvesting that crop so that you can store it and sile it and preserve it for feed out later on. And it becomes more of a moisture issue than a yield issue. And I wanna talk a little bit about that and in siling proper, properly. Now when we get to genetics, um, there's a lot of different things that kind of go into this decision a little bit. Uh, first of all, whether you have a grain or forage decision for, for yield, grain yield, of course for grain, if you're gonna use that field for grain harvest, you want as high a yield as you can get. But for silage, you may not necessarily need as high a grain yield as you can get. You can still get energy out of other parts of the plant, like the stalk and the leaves, and, and things like that. So really, you just want to have adequate grain yield compared to a, a field managed for grain. Likewise, forage yield for grain, it doesn't matter, it just needs to be adequate. You gotta have the factory out there. But for, if you're gonna harvest it for silage, you wanna have as high a forage yield as you can get. So these decisions, as you move up and down this, change a little bit depending on the end use of that particular field that you're gonna have out there. And this is from the genetic side. And we have a wide range of corn hybrids that can be selected. And I'll get into this a little bit more. And then on the management side, um, what we see, for example, like with plant population, uh, typically we're recommending about 35 to 38,000 plants per acre to get at as high of grain yield as we can. And with corn silage, typically we would recommend about two to 4,000 plants more per acre to get at the highest milk per acre that we could get. And so some of these decisions vary a little bit depending upon whether you're using that field or growing that field for grain versus silage. But so oftentimes in the end though, what happens is, is it's usually the worst looking fields that get into the actual, actual uh, uh, silo uh, at the end of the season. But I think, again, one of the things that we, you know, we kind of come back to all the time within our program is just what makes a good forage. And corn silage, here's a list of what we have, high yield, high digestibility, low fiber, high protein, and being able to store it or have it at the right moisture. And corn silage fits the bill here pretty well except for the high protein part, and that's where alfalfa comes in. Uh, alfalfa's a great, uh, uh, plant to be growing along with corn silage for, for dairy use. The ultimate test though is animal performance. We turn these plots around, so we finished harvesting about a week ago this year. Right now we're in the middle of grinding all the samples and we'll have the results out by the end of, uh, by, by the beginning of November basically is when we'll have the results out. If we were to feed all of these 
silages. We, put, we harvest about 2,000 plots a year. If we were to har you know, feed all these, you know, there's no way we could get that data turned around. So we use a model. And through the years, we've used various models, Milk 91, Milk 95, Milk 2000. Right now, we're on Milk 2006. And, um, and there will be a new one coming out. I think we'll name it Milk 2050, so we don't have to update the model for a while again. But, but uh, know that the model is probably our best way to get at kind of the how this silage is going to uh, perform within the, within the dairy cow. And these models are basically updated as we get more information and as the National Research Council basically updates their approach to uh, feeding dairy cows. And so, um, but anyway, um, there's, a, there's a bunch of these different models that are out there. So we've been testing corn silage hybrids now since 1995. Uh, this would be our, I guess, our uh, 29th season of doing that. And I kind of look at this whole effort as kind of the commercial uh, consumer report, if you will, of, of corn silage hybrids uh, in the state. The objective really is to uh, evaluate these and, and uh, measure milk per, uh, corn silage yield, milk per ton, milk per acre, look at all the different quality factors that go into this, and then try to rank them. And, um, but this has pretty big impacts. Uh, we're seeing, again, about a two bushel per acre increase with corn. Just a one bushel increase is about eight to 32 million dollars in the state. And if you increase one ton per acre, it's about 20 to 60 million dollars. So this is an important decision that, that I, I feel lucky to be a part of. I don't know how much we really are making, can account for the progress of this, but we're helping growers identify at least some of these high performing corn hybrids that are available commercially. Every year we test about three to 400 hybrids. So one year we were over 500. And I figure we only get about a third of the commercially available hybrids uh, in the state of Wisconsin. So there's a lot of hybrids that we likely tested a few years ago that are being sold now. But uh, again, that's only about a third of what we actually get in any particular year. These results are available, again, uh, usually in November. Uh, there's a number of uh, things to keep in mind as you pick these hybrids. We always try to identify and use data from multi-location average data. And what you should be looking at is the overall yield of that as well as the consistency. And evaluating for yield, milk per acre, and milk per ton. This is what we star as being the highest, uh, the best way to pick a, a corn silage hybrid because it incorporates all of the various quality aspects that go into any particular hybrid. Of course, in the bioengineered era that we're in right now with transgenic hybrids, there's a few other things that need to be uh, uh, talked about a little bit. And that is to, uh, every hybrid's gotta stand on its own for performance, buy the traits you need, and I know this is hard to do, uh, but uh, sometimes you're just forced to take a smart stack or a triple stack or something. But if you can, buy the traits you need. And then finally, pay attention to seed costs. And for us in extension, we never used to worry that much about seed costs. But the price difference between some of these hybrids is really important now. And uh, it becomes oftentimes very difficult to pay for some of those extra transgenic traits that are available commercially. In the end, though, <clears throat> remember that a lot of the traits that are available for corn silage right now do not really add to yield. What they're doing out there is they're protecting yield, and they're really allowing the crop to handle stress much better than what we could do 20 or 30 years ago. The only exception, I think, is a trait called drought guard, which we haven't really had a drought until this year, and hopefully uh, we have some drought guard hybrids in our, in our in our trials this year, and we can take a little look at those uh, this, this coming year. Okay, so let's look at this, this corn silage pile a little bit more closely, and many of you have probably seen this before. Basically, in a pile, you can divide that, that pile into grain as well as stover, which is leaves and, and stalk and shank and that sort of a thing. Grain is typically about half of that pile, 
and it's about 80 to 95 percent digestible. And there's a number of factors that impact um, that starch digestibility, and some of these are listed here. But a lot of things, many things, the point is many things can influence that digestibility. On the Stover side, again, it's about half the pile in, in corn silage, and only about um, 40 to 70 percent of that of that stover portion is digestible. So oftentimes, if there's a lot of progress made in digestibility, it's on this stover side, and BMR corn is one example of this, where you can have very high digestibility with the brown midrib corn. But there's things that influence this as well. There's a lot of debate about how long the silage lasts within the dairy cow. We've always used 48 hours because we want to get at the potential, if you will, of these hybrids. But know that there is 24, 30 hour um, digestion periods, very controversial. Additives can influence this a little bit. But in the end, really what we're talking about is when you have a two to three unit drop in fiber or starch, basically you can decrease milk production by about one pound, uh, one pound per day. Now on the Stover side, probably the biggest extremes are the BMR types. Uh, there's no question that BMR corn has a lot more digestibility with it as far as the Stover part of that pile of corn silage, and cows seem to respond to it. Okay, but what you give up is you give up the yield in the field, if you will, with, with those BMR hybrids. Uh, there's been some work done through the years, um, uh, basically looking at the kind of response you can get with BMR corn, and basically you're looking at about a half a pound per day increase of fat-corrected milk with using BMR corn. But there is this range that goes on within, with, within the stover portion of the pile, and a lot of this comes back to the genetics or the original a kind of hybrid that you that you select. On the starch side, uh, we're basically looking at what are called flowery endosperms versus flint. And in the in corn, as you go north, there's typically more and more flint types of backgrounds in a lot of our corn hybrids than in the south. And uh, and so you'll have uh, again oftentimes that flint background, which can be somewhat a little bit more challenging digestible, digestibly, but a lot of that can be taken out in the silo um, as you go through the ensiling process that goes on. But again, as starch content, um, or st as starch digestion increases, basically milk yield goes up. And uh, again, you need to keep this in mind as you look at the amount of starch that might be present within um, within um, uh, a corn silage hybrid. Having said all this, uh, this is some data that basically looks at the trials that we've conducted through the years. And it's basically the range between the top hybrid in a trial versus the bottom hybrid in a trial. And this difference is, is shown in red here. Sometimes we'll see over eight tons of dry matter per acre difference for yield between the top hybrid in a, in a trial and the bottom hybrid in a trial. Some years it's a lot less, it's only one or two tons of dry matter difference. And on average, it's about three and a half tons of dry matter per acre difference between the top hybrid and the bottom hybrid in a trial. This is significant. I mean, this is quite a bit of, of yield that can often be swung basically just on the hybrid that you pick and it's a decision you make at your kitchen table, basically, okay? So, again, a big difference in terms, of the over, in terms of the yield. When we look at it from a milk per ton basis, on average, it's about 470 pounds of milk per ton difference between the top hybrid and bottom hybrid in a trial. And when you multiply this out to milk per acre, um, it averages about 12,000 pounds of milk per acre. Okay, and again, even if this is just half, let's just say it's 6,000 pounds of milk per acre. That's a big swing in terms of a hybrid selection decision that, again, you make at the, uh, at the kitchen table a little bit. Typically, the way we help growers try to uh, pick these hybrids or identify these top 
performing hybrids is this, is this chart here. Um, basically, the way this chart works is this is kind of the average for the trial right in the center for milk per ton and milk per acre. And then that oval there is basically the error associated with it. And you can kind of visually move that oval around a little bit to look at statistical differences between, between hybrids. And basically what we encourage people to do is to pick hybrids in this upper right quadrant where it's high yield as well as high quality. And these hybrids now that are bolded here, these are, these are hybrids that were basically statistically not different from the top yield, top hybrid for yield, milk per ton, and milk per acre. So these really are the best hybrids in this trial that, that uh, we saw, uh, and this was in 2021. And we do this every year. You can, you can, you can uh, get our results and identify by zone or maturity belt and, uh, and uh, basically identify things here a little bit. But if you look at, again, milk per acre, what we're looking at here is a hybrid that came in at about 35,000 pounds of milk per acre, all the way up to hybrids that are 43,000 pounds, 42,000 pounds. Again, that's a, you know, about a 7,000 pound per acre swing that you have just with hybrid selection. So this is a very key part of managing for uh, corn silage on your farm. The criteria we use is yield still drives everything. Um, I always like to have good grain yield as well because this allows flexibility. If you've got enough forage and you've picked a good hybrid that also has good grain yield, you can sell that grain if you need to sell the grain uh, and move it off your dairy. So having uh, good grain yield as part of this is, is is also just keeps that flexibility up. Silage quality is important. We see that with the BMR hybrids especially. And I think there's going to be more and more of these kinds of quality hybrids that come that become available in the future. For relative maturity, you can usually go a little longer season because you're not so worried about getting that crop um, mature before killing frost. Every relative maturity unit means about two bushels per acre in terms of grain yield is what we measure. So as you go from 90 days to, to 100 days relative maturity, that's 20 bushels of grain typically that we'll see between a shorter season and a longer season hybrid. Longer season hybrids always give you, or usually, I shouldn't say, usually give you greater grain yield than shorter season hybrids. Standability allows flexibility. A BMR hybrid's probably likely gonna go down on you if you get any kind of wind. And we've had examples of that where in some years we get a wind during September and that whole field goes down. And more than likely that guy will never grow BMR corn again because they're a real mess to harvest. So having good standability in a hybrid, again, allows some of that flexibility. And then having good pest resistance. Again, the, the bottom line though is that there's a lot of variability that goes on with the hybrids we have commercially available. Again, we're only looking at about three to 400, 500 hybrids a year, but we see a tremendous amount of variability uh, among the hybrids. All right, that's all I wanted to say about corn hybrids. The next slide I think is, I think is the most important slide in the whole talk that I'm gonna give here. And this is what happens normally during the season for corn silage. And the reason I say this is, is because if you understand what's going on in this graph here, you can manage that corn silage, I think, uh, as the season throws things at you a little bit. And what we're gonna do here is basically go through the different stages of life cycle of corn from basically uh, silking all the way through grain filling. And we're gonna look at the relative increase or change that goes on with various measures that we're looking at. So um, one of the things that's unique about corn silage compared to most forages is that we see this double peak that goes on uh, in a forage. At flowering, corn silage, like other forages, is very good quality, okay? And this is as measured by milk per ton. 
After flowering, just like other forages, alfalfa or other things, quality goes down, all right? And then beginning about the milk or dough stage, that quality actually reverses itself and gets better as those kernels begin to fill. And we have better quality at maturity than we do at flowering with corn silage. At the end, it kind of tails off there a little bit. But this is largely due to the grain. But we, I just call this kind of the double peak of, um, of corn silage. One, you're maximizing your NDFD. And the other, you're maximizing your starch content. And again, we can use this oftentimes. For example, let's say we have an emergency forage situation. And you planted that field for corn, lost that field for whatever reason. We've planted corn in August, for example, and seen very good quality because the killing frost hits at this silking, silking part. And so we still can get pretty good quality corn silage. And in some years, we've gotten five tons dry matter per acre planting in August. Okay, so we can get some pretty good yields, fairly good quality because we're hitting this first peak. All right, that's just an example. When we look at NDFD, which is the digestibility of the stover, the best digestibility is right at flowering. And as it goes through the rest of the season, it goes down a little bit. It doesn't really change that much, less than you might think. Um, it goes down to maybe 85 to 90 percent of what it was at, at the silking stage of development. All right. <clears throat> What's really changing, though, is the grain yield. We kind of go through a lag period. Uh, period here where all that's going on is cell division. We have a 40-day linear period here where those cells get filled, and then we have about a 10-day maturation period. So if you're going to produce 200 bushels per acre, basically what you're doing is, is you're filling those kernels over a 40-day period, or every day it's about five bushels per acre per day. Some days it's a seven bushel day, some days it's only a three bushel day, but on average for 200 bushels, you're gonna get about a five bushel per acre per day rate of increase out there in the field. Okay. <clears throat> and when we look at uh, milk per acre, basically we're at our best milk per acre at that second peak uh, when starch content is at its best. And the last thing I wanna talk about here is, is, is the moisture of, the, of that of the grain, primarily. And what we see here is that up until about the dent stage, it's at fairly high moisture. But uh, as we go past dent, that can drop relatively quickly. And we can use this to basically adjust the moisture as we cut to fill the silo. If you want to lower the moisture, let's say the chopper shows up at your door and, and um, and it's, it's too wet, well, one way, to, one way to lower that moisture, because that grain is starting to dry in here, is to raise the cutter bar. We can move it four points by moving that cutter bar one foot, okay? If, you want, if you're too dry, one of the things you can do is lower that cutter bar, because most of that moisture is in the bottom part of that stock there. So, again, this is, uh, this is just something to keep in mind. Uh, as we move to a different kind of a phenotype of corn where we might have shorter corn, I question how high we can raise that cutter bar sometimes because those ears are going to be placed very low and you're just not going to have a lot of flexibility there. But uh, that uh, remains to be seen how much short corn we have down, down the road. Okay, uh, oh, that was grain moisture. I'm sorry. This was forage moisture, and this is grain moisture. The grain moisture is always going to be drier than the forage moisture um, as we go through the harvest season. Everything, though, depends on pollination success. If it's poor, you know, basically you can harvest at any time because you're not going to get any, any bushels put onto that ear at all. If it's fair, leave for silage harvest. If it's good, you've got all the options available to to, uh, to harvest. And there's a lot of things that can be done. You can harvest for silage and treadlage, of course. We are dealing with earlage, toplage, uh, snaplage. Uh, we just took our snaplage high harvest uh, this last Monday. Um, and then you can also have bottomlage and grain harvest later on as well, too. But understanding this graph here is really, I think, key to 
managing uh, corn silage um, down the road. All right, so before we get into some of these management things, what I wanted to do is just explain how we do this at, at the University of Wisconsin. We typically have about 2,000 hybrid trials that we, that we plant and manage every year. And then we have about 1,000 plots that we look at for management. And these plots are typically eight rows wide, where we harvest four rows for corn silage, and then we leave four rows to come back later and harvest for grain. So we know exactly how uh, a treatment like uh, 30,000 plants per acre yielded at, at silage harvest, and we also know what it did later on at grain harvest. All right, so we know both ends, basically, of the harvest, of the harvest window. So these are all what I just call dual plots, where we're harvesting silage as well as grain, and the data you're gonna see here is basically showing some of this a little bit. We ultimately measure this using Milk 2006, and uh, we'll just run through some of these management decisions that need to be made. Now again, you got on your, on, your, on your handout this thing, there's a lot of things up here. I'm just gonna point out a couple of things. If you look at decisions, whether it's a hybrid selection decision or fertilizer, uh, you can look at you know, where that economic optimum is. Typically, the range for hybrids was, is we're seeing is about three and a half tons dry matter per acre. On the grain side, it's about 70 bushels per acre, just on the hybrid you pick, and, and what we see within our trials. And then when I put some $5 corn to that, that's about a $350 swing. And if you look at this list here, really the big three, if you will, are hybrid, fertilizer, and pest control. As you go to some of these other decisions, like planting date, May 1 versus June 1, that's a 1.2 ton dry matter per acre swing for yield based on, on whether you plant May, May 1 or June 1. It's about 60 bushels on the grain size, and you have the double whammy of lower yields and also wetter corn that you gotta dry down at the end of the season, okay? But some of these decisions make really mean nothing. And I'm gonna just highlight one here, row spacing. We had a lot of interest in going to narrower rows. Well, if you look at row spacing, that hardly makes a dent. It's about four tenths of a ton dry matter per acre difference. It comes out to about five to 7% change in yield. Not a lot of difference out there. And a lot of these decisions sometimes really don't make a lot of sense from an economic or an impact on your farm. But these three things really do, and planning date and some other things can make some significant inputs as well. But you can kind of use this slide to uh, identify where you need to put your time. You know, where are you going to see the biggest yield swings that go on uh, as you wrestle with some of these decisions? So for example, planting date, here's one. We've got about 30 years of work here, uh, basically looking at uh, you know, the, the, the planting date effect on, on forage yield for corn silage. It really starts to tail off as you get into June, but, and the best time to plant corn really is around May 1, just like you would for grain. Okay, but typically what gets into the silage pile? It's the stuff out here, right? It's always a light planted corn that, uh, that really doesn't yield all that much. But by going and planting on May 1, when you would regular grain, uh, a field for grain, you can increase that yield quite a bit. And uh, again, my mission here is just to basically encourage growers to treat corn silage fields like they would corn for grain fields, because really the return value or the value of that, of that corn silage field is a lot more than it is for grain because you can turn around and turn that into milk and you can add value to that corn silage through the milk that you're feeding. Another example, and I think the best example out there for row spacing effects is a study done at Michigan. Basically, they had 15, 20, uh, 22, and 30-inch row spacings. And basically, what they saw was that they were able to increase forage yield by going to narrower rows, okay? Uh, they increased it about uh, 0.8 tons or so, or not even that, um, about 0.5 tons or so uh, with forage yield. Again, not a big swing, but they did see significant increases. 
Another decision is corn plant population. One of the things we're seeing with growers in the Midwest is a significant increase in the amount of plants that are planted per acre. In 1980 and 82, we were about a little over 20,000 plants per acre. Now we're up around over 30,000 plants per acre typically. And this is not only Wisconsin, but the rest of the Corn Belt as well is, is doing very, very, uh, very high yield, uh, very high plant populations compared to the 30, 40 years ago. A lot of questions come up on this. My biggest issue is what happens with risk here. Um, and we also have a lot of what we call variable rate kinds of technologies available today to basically prescribe fields, if you will, for uh, plant population. But the upshot here is what does this mean for yield and, and the economics of things? Along the bottom here, I've got harvest plant population in plants per acre. And if you look at grain yield, typically our best grain yields are at around 41, 40, 41,000 plants per acre right now. But we're at 95% of that yield way over here at about 30,000 plants per acre. Okay, and I always figure if I can get 95% of something, that's pretty good and, and good enough oftentimes. But if you wanna get that last little bit, you need to be up around 40, 41,000 plants per acre to maximize that yield. When we look at this from an economic optimum where we're looking at $300 a bag corn and, uh, and drying costs and that sort of a thing, that grain yield optimum is different than the economic optimum. The economic optimum is around 35,000 plants per acre, and we're at that 95% yield level at about 26, 27,000 plants per acre. Okay, so that's what we see for grain. Yeah, Jim. <clears throat> Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot. These are, these are general. So uh, depending on the trial and the year that we've done this, I'm just showing about 10 years of data here. Um, uh, we've tested uh, up to about 12 hybrids at six locations around the state. And we do pick up hybrid by plant population interactions. The trouble is it's very difficult to predict that. By the time I'd figure it out, we're on the new hybrids. And so I can never catch up. If you want to find information on that, the best thing to do is talk to your seed rep. Okay, and that's the best way to get a handle on how a hybrid might work. But even then, I'd be, I'd be suspect because oftentimes hybrids are sold as fix or flex kinds of hybrids. And to me, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, I, I think in general, you're probably better off taking this kind of an approach and just know that that optimum population is changing and growers are reacting to it and it's going up is basically the way I would think about it and I'll, I'll in the next slide I'll show you how to approach that decision on a farm standpoint so that's what we see on the grain side on the silage side we optimize our forage yield way up here at about 49,000 plants per acre okay that's where we optimize the forage yield on this thing. Now, what about quality? Where's our best quality in this kind of a deal? Well, our best quality is way at the other end, at the lowest populations that we see. And it goes down, but not very really steeply. It's kind of a straight line relationship. It kind of goes down like that. But our best quality is at the lowest plant population. And so when you combine the two of yield and milk, milk per ton, we find out that the best milk per acre, which is the best economic kind of indicator for a farm, is going to be at about 45 to 46,000 plants per acre. Now, again, most guys are a little over probably 32,000 plants per acre, and so they're hitting a lot of these, a lot of these marks pretty well. At least they're over 95% of the time, 95% of their yields that they, they could be getting. But again, the point is, is to know that this is changing. And the way I would approach it is, whatever you think a field should be planted at, plant the majority of that field at 30,000 or whatever it is, plants per acre. If you feel it's 35, put it at 35. But for one round or one strip, increase it about 10%. Okay, and just see if you see a hybrid response or a field response 
to your management style with that, with that higher plant population. And again, know that this is changing as we, as we go through time here a little bit. And it's one of the decisions that um, can swing yield a little bit. Not as much as hybrid selection, not as much as planting date, but it can move things. And again, I, I always feel if you're within 95%, hey, that's good enough oftentimes. On the nutrient side, again, there's differences between a field managed for grain versus silage. And again, just know that this occurs. There's, these are uh, fairly typical kinds of removal rates that oftentimes occur with, with between grain and silage. And know that you're probably going to have to put on a little more fertilizer on the silage side. And we oftentimes do this through manure. The other point I want to make, though, is that we're seeing a lot of secondary nutrients and micronutrients become much more important or much more rem removal with our modern hybrids. This is some data from Roger Elmore and others, John Sawyer at Iowa State, where they looked at these secondary nutrients here and micronutrients. And if you look at basically what they did was they took a set of hybrids developed in the 2000s versus a set of hybrids in 1960. And you'll see that in every case for these nutrients, when you look at the silage port part, there is more nutrient removal of calcium, magnesium, and sulfur of modern hybrids than there was for uh, 1960s hybrids. Okay, we see this for the secondary nutrients, and we also see this for the micronutrients. In every case except manganese. That was the only one where they did not see any change. There's no difference between 1960s hybrids and, and, uh, and 2000 hybrids in the case of manganese. But every other nutrient uh, that was being removed from the field through Stover was really higher for these more modern hybrids that are there. So just some things to consider and think about and be, be watching for as you have a field that's grown more and more uh, with um, uh, um, uh, more and more with corn silage and you're removing everything. The best thing you can do is add manure back is really one of the best things you can do. All right, last, I got two more points. One is harvest timing. Uh, and this is, I think, the second most difficult decision we encounter in Wisconsin. And the county agents and educators we've got now I think, do, and, the, and the industry itself has done a really good job of helping farmers time this silage harvest a little better. And basically here are the problems that you have when it's too wet or too dry. And uh, uh, what I always do is approach it like this. And, and basically, um, depending on the silage structure or silo that you're using, you would have different ideal moisture contents for those structures. And we used to use kernel milk or kernel milk line as uh, kind of the timing of it, but we know that doesn't work. We see a huge range among hybrids for this kernel milk line. But what I say is just use it as a trigger. And what I mean by that is once the kernel milk line gets on a horizontal bunker to 80% kernel milk, take a moisture level. Take a moisture reading with that. If it's too wet, it's gonna to be too wet, all right? But at 80% kernel milk, it's gonna to be too wet, but you'll know where you're at. And then we know that as we go through the harvest season and corn silage typically, we lose about a half a percent of moisture per day uh, as we go through that, through that season. Some years it's more like this year is probably gonna be a little more because it's been so dry. Uh, and sometimes as we have wet years where it's gonna be a little slower, but on average, it's a half a percent. If you know where you are there, then you can kind of predict when that, when that chopper should show up. So let's say you're at 74% moisture here and you, and you know the kernel milk line's moving and you want to store it in a horizontal bunker. Well, if you take 4% above 70%, that means you're gonna, it's eight days basically that, that that field would likely be ready to be harvested. Again, four days divided by 0.5, and in eight days, that chopper hopefully will show up to, to cut, your, cut your corn silage. The point, though, is, is that by doing this trigger like this, 
you can kind of get at 80% kernel milk, you can get an idea of your moisture and then be able to predict out what's going to happen later on. Once you're in the thick of harvest, though, there's still some things you can do. We know that as we raise the cutter bar, we, can, we will lower the yield, and this is typically what will happen when we go from 6 to 18 inches. Yield goes down about 15% because you're leave, leaving the lowest quality uh, part, uh, the, you know, the, the bottom part of the stock out there in the field. But what happens is you increase your milk per ton, and you overall basically only decrease your milk per acre about 4% or so. But what's really interesting, I think, is the moisture changes that go on. You lose only about uh, 4 to 5% uh, of your moisture. You can adjust your moisture 4 to 5% as you raise and lower that cutter bar about a foot. All right? Okay, so as we look at try this harvest timing issue that goes on and, and uh, things, um, again, the way... I would approach this, and again, this is, a, this is the, I think the second most difficult decision we make is note the hybrid maturity and planting dates of the fields, note the tasseling date. Typically, whether we grow a hybrid in the southern part of Wisconsin or the northern part of Wisconsin or the Corn Belt, it doesn't really matter because we're always going to have about a 55 to 60 day grain filling period. So. So over that 55 to 60 days, you know, you saw the grain, grain filling, uh, the, the sigmoidal S-shaped curve that typically goes on with grain filling. If you know when that silking date or tasseling date occurs, all you basically have to do is add 42 to 45 days onto that, and that puts you right about at that milk stage or that, that milk line stage that you need to harvest. The differences we see for maturity in corn in Wisconsin because we grow 115 day in the south and a, you know, a 80 day in the north, the differences we see are due to the vegetative part of the growth cycle of the plant. In the southern part of the state, we have 22 to or 23 to 21 to 23 leaves basically, and in the north, we only got about 15 day, 15 leaves on the plant. So that's how we get the differences in maturity. The difference, the, the differences during grain filling are really not very much. And so if you know the tasseling date, add 42 to 47 days on, and that'll get you about half a milk line. As that kernel milk line starts to move, do one of these triggers where you go out and measure the actual moisture out there. And then you can do a final check at harvest. And a lot of these choppers nowadays have got in-stream NIR machines in there, and they can kind of adjust that moisture. Moisture is really easy to measure with an NIR, NIR machine you can basically adjust the cutting height, if you will, as you're moving through the field. All right, so that's the last uh, thing I want to talk about from a management's perspective. I don't know if we got time to get into value here a little bit, but I want to just touch a little bit on value of corn silage. And, and I want to um, just kind of introduce this because I think as we talk about corn silage, we talk about tonnage all the time, and we try to relate tons of silage to grain equivalents or bushels in that ton of silage. Then we set a price based upon the Chicago Board of Trade price. And that's the way it's traditionally been done, and, and yet I think there's a better way. And I want to just show you, and, I, and the better way is really how the sugar industry has done. done. They've done the same thing here. Um, so when we, look at, when we look at value, you've got a seller and a buyer, and really from a seller perspective, yield and milk per acre is really what drives this decision. But from a buyer perspective, as a dairyman, what you're really interested in is milk per ton. I've often said I'd buy all the BMR corn I could buy as long as I didn't have to grow it. Because what, I take, what, I, what happens in a BMR field is you, you lose all that yield. We see typically, even with our sixth generation BMR hybrids, we still see this 15 to 20 percent yield drag that goes on with BMR corn. Okay, so milk per ton is what really drives it from a dairyman perspective. There are characteristics and, and, idea, and things that are different between the uh, buyer and the seller, and I've just got some of these listed here. Um, I want to get to um, 
Uh, this year, uh, typically, it's a little more expensive to grow corn silage because you've got greater harvesting costs oftentimes. You've got more shrink that occurs. In corn, si in corn grain, we, we take into account shrink, but it's not nearly the amount of shrink that goes on in a corn silage pile. A good shrink on corn silage is about 15%. Usually, it's running a lot higher than that. Whereas with grain, we, 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 we account for it, but it's not all that much. And then you got the fertilizer removal differences between corn for grain and corn for silage, which we already talked about. So as we look at trying to get at yield and price information, in the past, we've kind of used Jorgensen and Crowley's report, approach, which was first kind of published in 1972. If you look at this, it kind of maxes out at about um, 150 bushels per acre. That's a poor yield nowadays. You know, we're seeing so many fields now above 200 bushels. And so what we've done is used our data that we've collected through the years of these dual plots. We know the silage yield, we know the grain yield, and we've come up with this uh, approach here for grain equivalents. This is the old 1972 approach. Here's what we see nowadays, and typically a lot of people use 8 to 8.2 bushels in one ton of silage, and that's typically what a lot of contracts are based on. You take that 8 bushels and multiply it by the Chicago Board of Trade price, and that's the value of your corn silage, okay? But I think there are different, there's another approach. One of the other things that we can do is, if we know the yield and we know the starch content, we can actually back calculate that, 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 uh, that, that silage pile and look at how many actual bushels are in there. And that's what I did over here was basically the starch method approach to, to doing that. If we just use 70% starch in a, in a kernel of grain and back calculate it, this is what the actual bushels per ton would be and we know that there's gonna be a bias, and that bias is around one and a half, one to one and a half bushels that you need to add back in to really get at how many bushels were in there. But if you know starch content, and you know tonnage or yield, you can back calculate to get at the actual grain that's there. And why do I say that? Well, here's an example of some data that we collected for three years, I don't know how many hybrids, six hybrids, something like that. But I want to, sh these are all the same hybrids. And as you look at the minimum hybrid, first of all, look at the average. The average goes from about 6.4 to about 8.6. This is an average across all the hybrids. So if you're gonna use 8.2, some years or some silages, you're not, you're gonna be paying way too much. And some of the time, you might be paying a little bit over at this 8.6. But look at the extremes. This is a hybrid in one trial that was at 3.8 bushels per ton of silage. And this is one at 10.5 tons bushels per ton of silage. Again, by using this starch approach, you can back calculate exactly how many bushels would be present in that silage to get a more fair price of what actually goes on. But that's what, almost a seven, ton, seven bushel per ton swing based on grain equivalents. And um, again, I just put this up as some uh, food for thought, think about a little bit. Um, I've talked about this a lot, but no, one's, no one listens to me and no one changes. But that's okay. But, but a lot of people still use this 8.2 bushels per ton. But the sugar industry uses this for sugar beets, basically. They, a, a grower is paid on the amount of sugar de delivered to the factory. Why won't a grower be paid for the amount of starch that's delivered or energy or whatever you wanted to do to calculate that delivered to the dairy? And I'll just stop at that point with that. So, all right. Thanks for your attention. You've been a good audience and uh, uh, covered a lot of ground. And if you want to get a hold of things or want to see what we're doing, our results will be out in about a month or so and uh, for 2023. Uh, an interesting year. You know, a grower doesn't like that, this kind of a year, but an agronomist loves it because we start to see whether our recommendations 
hold up as we get into some of these stress years. And I think it's just going to get worse as time goes on here. So anyway, thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, Thomas. We're on what? Oh, um, they only, uh, I sent nine pages. They probably only copied eight. Sorry. Uh, Yes. Okay. Right. Tom's, point, Tom's question is, this was obviously a very dry year. What have we seen as far as yield and quality of what might be going on in Wisconsin? And uh, we've already harvested our silage plots, and we know the yields, we don't know the quality yet, because we're grinding samples right now. But we know the yield, and typically we see a range of about eight to 10 tons of dry matter per acre across the state. This year, we average 10.8 10 tons of dry matter per acre. So it's almost a ton higher than what we typically average across the state. Now, what do I expect in terms of quality? Well, um, the last time we had a drought year well, it was 2012, but the one that I remember is 2005. And I remember visiting with Randy Shaver, uh, who was the UW animal nutritionist. And I remember as they fed out that crop, he complained about how hot the corn silage was. In other words, we had real short plants because we went through a stress during the vegetative period where we didn't have very tall plants, but we had record grain yields that year because we got the rain at the right time. Well, I'm kind of expecting the same thing this year. I'm expecting very hot corn silage. In other words, higher starch content than normal than what we've seen. Given the yields that we've already measured so far at our 11 locations around the state. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there are fields that are really hammered, uh, especially on light soils, the dry, sandy soils. Those are going to be hurt, and I don't know. Whenever you got to stress, everything goes out the window anyway. But, but um, those fields aren't going to recover. But there's a lot of really good fields in spite of the drought. And again, we measured that in our plots this year. Nearly a ton higher dry matter yields than what we typically see on average. Other yes, Jim. Of using what method? The starch method? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yours? Is that yours? I don't know where I, I don't know where I got it from, but I I, <laughs> I know. I know. The question is, just take me through the calculation. All right, and I I I need to sit at a desk here and kind of work this out, but just roughly. If we have if we have a ton of silage and we've got 35% starch content, so that'd be 2,000 pounds times 0.35, all right? So what is that roughly? That's about 700 pounds of starch, basically, in that, pi in that ton of corn silage. We know that corn grain is about 70% starch, okay? That's the, that's the typical, typical so you take that 700 pounds, divide it by 0.7, and so now we're looking at basically 1,000 pounds of grain in that, in, that, in that silage, okay? And then divide that by 56 pounds per bushel, okay? Let's see now, 1,000 divided by 56. How much does that come out to? Um, 20, 18, and I, I'm talking dry matter here. So this is dry matter. So we're looking at about 18 bushels in that ton of dry matter 
and then multiply that by an average yield of, of, uh, of uh, 10 tons dry matter per acre, per acre, and we're up to about 180 bushels, okay? Now, there has to be a bias in there as well because I'm using 0.7 starch content, but in grain, there's also the seed coat, there's the embryo, and there's other things. And it's about one and a half, it's about one and a half tons, basically, is what I see as a bias in there. But again, if you know the starch content, whether it's 35% or 30% or whatever, you can back calculate and get at the actual bushels in that, in that ton of corn size. And I did it on a dry matter basis, and I come up with 18, and people are using eight tons, but that's on a fresh basis, okay? So again, I'd have to sit down to figure it out exactly, but the point is you can back calculate this to get the actual bushels that are in a ton of silage in a field. And that is a better and fairer estimate. There still has to be a lot of negotiation, but that gets at a better estimate, basically, of what that field might have yielded because some of those fields have only got three, three uh, bushels per ton of silage. We, we see that in our, in our, in our data. Okay, okay. That's a little low. Well, that gets into how important it is to a nutritionist. And, and I think there, there are a lot of things that go into this. My, my point of trying to raise the issue is, is, that, is that we see this huge swing and getting at the value of it is a function of the amount of starch in there as well as the energy that you can derive from that stover. And I think I think the nutritionist is going to have as big of impact at the table as the agronomist that's trying to measure yield and the dairyman that, for what he wants in, in, in the dairy. So I don't know how you get at a value of that, but certainly you could have attached some sort of a value to it. But again, you can, using 8.2 roughly, or just using 8.2 across the whole thing, I don't think is fair oftentimes. Probably over years it's fair. You know, some years a dairyman's going to pay more to a, to a grain farmer than, than other years, but, but, and it probably averages all out, but you could have, well, like a year like this year where, you know, it could be very different, or you might just have a field that's way off. And, you know, I, I kind of deal with some of those fields sometimes where you have really low starch content and Obviously, it's not 8.2 bushels per ton of silage. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Excellent talk. Uh, I apologize for having to cut off questions, but after the top of the hour here. Uh, and speaking of kind of valuing feedstuffs, we got a great presentation this afternoon from uh, Dr. Bill Weiss, who's uh, uh, going to be presenting about valuing feedstuffs. So, Jim, I encourage you to come back and and pose that same question to Bill later on. So uh, Joe will be around for a few minutes for some questions if you've got them. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you'd like to, uh, if you didn't get a copy of the handout, there's, uh, there's hop copies back there. And also, again, if you are a CCA uh, certified crop advisor and need credits, the sign-up sheet is over there on the table. I'll see you at 1.30 for our afternoon presentation. Thanks. Thank you.